Hey everybody, I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust, and we're standing on one of the most iconic spots on the Gettysburg Battlefield, and that is Little Round Top. We're actually standing on what is called Vincent's Spur today, and it's named after the gentleman that you may be able to pick out behind me in the trees, a man named Strong Vincent. He's a colonel uh, with the Fifth Army Corps, and he is uh, going to be prolific here in the story of uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, specifically here at Little Round Top. I'm joined today behind the camera by Doug uh, uh, Ullman. We have Chris Mikowski who will be joining us here in a few minutes and we'll talk about probably the most famous action here at Gettysburg and that's the defense and attack of Little Round Top which even has a book of a similar name. So how do we get from point A to point B? On the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863, if you have seen any of our earlier videos, the Confederate Army is starting to move around the Union left flank, and that will be John Bell Hood's division starting to initiate an assault near 4 o'clock to 4.30 in the afternoon. Don't ever believe these guys' watches back in the Civil War. We don't have standardized time yet. Regardless, Hood's men will start to send two brigades off in towards this direction. Their goal is not to take Little Round Top, which is contrary to a lot of popular belief. They are going to try to attack up the Emmitsburg Road to drive away the Union Third Army Corps and crash into that Union left flank. What ends up happening is that the Union Army had been moving throughout the day, and because of this, the Confederates also had to shift around. So now we found the end of the Union line and we start to go forward. As we do so, we start to run into some pesky sharpshooters from the 2nd U.S. Sharpshooters, commanded by Homer Stoughton. Those guys are going to start to draw some of these Confederates up into battle in places like Devil's Den and up onto Big Round Top and Little Round Top and eventually right towards where we're standing. And the way the battle will start to take place, most people think that Little Round Top's hit first. No, it's Devil's Den. Devil's Den is just down below me, maybe a quarter of a mile from where we're standing. You could get into the open and see what is going to become known as the Valley of Death, the Plum Run Valley, and then that strewn boulders known as the Devil's Den. So up here on Little Round Top, we'll have a signal station, a Union signal station. How do we signal anyone in the Civil War? Flags. They wigwag back and forth. Wigwagging back up, up here will be this signal station, and they're seeing Confederates massing out on the Union left. We need help. Also arriving in this area is a general named Governor Kimball Warren. Warren is a New York native in his early 30s, and he is an up-and-comer in the Army. He's the chief topographical engineer of the Army, so he has a good eye for terrain. Once he arrives up on top of Little Round Top, he will notice this Confederate force coming up towards us, and then he also realizes that the only Union force here is a signal station and he and his staff. That's not enough to hold back John Bell Hood and his determined Confederates. Warren's going to send word down into the valley, and he's going to see a marching column, and he's going to ask for troops to come up here. Who do they run into? One of his staff officers, a man named Colonel Strong Vincent, from Erie, Pennsylvania. I believe he's 26 years old, he's a Harvard graduate, and he's in command of four regiments of Union soldiers. Strong Vincent is gonna be asked by this staff officer, you know, where's your commanding officer? He says, don't worry, give me your orders. Twice he tells the staff officer that, and he's supposed to bring his brigade to Yonder Hill, which is here. Vincent breaks off from the rest of the Fifth Corps and comes up here under his own guise to set up a line. He's gonna not face to the west where the Confederates normally are. He's actually going to face most of his line off in this direction, which is actually towards the south, southwest. And his line will run right over top of where I'm standing, anchored on the left by the famous 20th Maine, run off to the 83rd Pennsylvania, that's Strong Vincent's old unit, then to the 44th New York, and then the 16th Michigan. The 44th New York and the 83rd Pennsylvania together were known as the Potomac Blues. And these guys knew each other so well, and they loved each other so much, this unit camaraderie, that they refused to not fight beside one another in battle. So they'll actually shift their lines at times during battle to make sure they are side by side. Now, all this is happening not in a static, not in a static uh, pause. The Confederates are still pouring towards us. Those will be uh, men commanded by Evander Law, and you might know the name William Oates. So coming down through this valley and up towards us will be Alabamians. Oh, and then there'll be some Texans. The Texas Brigade will split off and start coming up onto the other side of Little Round Top. And the way this battle is going to start to take shape, if my elbow is, big, is Devil's Den, the Confederates will start to hit here and then move up towards my left shoulder towards Little Round Top, eventually hitting Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the famous Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, his 20th Maine, very last. So as this battle starts to take shape up here, Vincent's men 
are going to start to start to put up a defensive line and hold out. They're up here maybe 15 minutes before the Confederates start to make their advance. So the skirmishers will go out in front. Those are your feelers. And as soon as they deploy into the valley below us, they're going to be hit by the Confederates, pushed back towards where we are. And now the Union Army knows that these soldiers in gray are coming. Warren's going to try to get more troops up here, and they will have some cannon that show up here under Captain Hazlitt, and then, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Hazlitt, and then we'll also have uh, some men from New York and Pennsylvania show up under uh, the command of Stephen Weed. But this battle is going to start to grow, and it's going to come up in intensity. And I'm going to kick it over to, to Chris Mikowski to talk a little bit about um, just the intensity of the fighting up here on Little Round Top. And uh, the uh, monument in the back to the 83rd Pennsylvania, it is but isn't uh, Strong Vincent, striking a very martial pose. Vincent actually went into a battle carrying a riding crop, so the statue has, a, has actually a sword. Um, regulations prohibited soldiers or individual officers having their own monuments, and so that's why they disguised Vincent as uh, having a sword rather than the, the riding crop. But he's really the central figure who saves this position. He's got these four hard-fighting regiments, gets them into position. Um, as Chris mentioned, they've got about 15 minutes before the onslaught happens, 15 well-dramatized minutes in the movie Gettysburg, if you uh, watch Jeff Daniels, and uh, my good friend Doug Ullman's going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, but that belies the intensity of what actually happens once the tide starts breaking across this hill. Things get super intense. Chris talked about the arrival of Hazlitt's battery. Is uh, soon after that, um, you know, when the, when the uh, the artillery starts opening up, it's a huge help to hold uh, Vincent's position. But on his right, a lot of attention focuses here on the left at the 20th Maine. But on his right, uh, the 16th Michigan, smallest uh, regiment in his entire brigade, and they start to crumble. He looks for some sort of help, and that's when Stephen Weeds arrives on the scene with the next brigade. He's going to get here with the 140th New York, guys from Rochester, uh, led by Patty O'Rourke. And O'Rourke, uh, just fresh out of West Point in the first uh, West Point class, He's uh, just a brilliant guy, lots of promise. He gets his men to help secure that flank and is killed almost immediately. So he gets his men here at the point of crisis, only in time to get killed. Vincent himself, in the midst of the intensity of this battle, is also mortally wounded in that fight. Hazlitt and Weed, uh, good friends, a uh, long time. Weed had just transferred into the infantry from the artillery, so the two of them knew each other. Weed gets to the top of the hill, and he is mortally wounded. As he's lying desperately, gasping for his last breaths, Hazlitt comes over to hear what his friend has to say and is shot in the head. So he gets killed. So all these guys who are showing up, leading men into the thick of the fight at just the right moment are really getting picked off. And so there's a, a leadership crisis that happens here on this hill as the men are trying to, to fight this desperate, desperate engagement. The units start to run out of ammunition, um, things get intense, and as Doug is about to talk about, um, things here on the far left flank get up close and personal and becomes perhaps one of the most famous fights here in the entire Battle of Gettysburg. Doug? Actually, we're going to kick it over to no, me for a We're going to kick it over to yeah, Chris. We're, right. we're going to move our way over here. Oh, look, it's a Gary Edelman sighting. Where did he oh come from? Oh, my God. Uh, we're actually, be careful, Doug. We're actually moving our way down the 20th Main's line here on Little Round Top. So, uh, as we talked about, the battle will start down in Devil's Den. It'll start working its way up towards the western, southwestern side of Little Round Top, and then it'll start to spread over to here. So, we have about uh, 377 men from the 20th Maine will take up a position in this uh, in this area where we are. Um, you might be able to see behind me their, uh, one of their monuments here on the Gettysburg Battlefield. The 20th Maine has uh, a few different monuments here. And as the 20th starts to put up a fight, they're going to start to fight with uh, some Alabamians who are starting to come up the hill. But what will happen over the course of the action, you always have to watch your flanks in a Civil War battle or a Revolutionary War. You're always looking to try to get on the side of an enemy, push them, this lodge them from a from a position so what will end up happening is these Alabamians will start to move as they can towards the east trying to wrap in and around Chamberlain's men and eventually they, they will do a what's called an undouble file that means they're gonna go from double files of line men uh, behind one another one one in front one in the rear to spread out this line and take up as much space as they can then they will eventually slightly refuse their line backwards to meet this threat that's starting to come up and around them. So that's what you're gonna to start to see out here. You're gonna see some shuffling with the 20th Maine. You'll see these Alabamians also start to shift around. And as the battle wears on, 
you're going to start to, to find that these men run out of ammunition very quickly. If you do the math, most soldiers come into battle with about 60 rounds of ammunition. And if you fire three aim shots a minute, you're out of ammunition within 15 to 20 minutes. And that's what's going to start to happen up here. Both sides will start to run out of ammunition. So you have to start to decide what should we do. Um, and there is some debate amongst the, the veterans of the 20th Maine of what happens up on top of this hill. Who said what? Who did what? Regardless of the debate, uh, Chamberlain will decide that there will be some sort of a charge that goes down the hill. And there's a few different stories. Uh, some say that he, it comes from Chamberlain, you know, he says the word bayonets and it goes right down the line and the men start to spring into action. Uh, company K claims that Holman and Melcher, uh, their company commander, will jump to the front and charge first and then everyone will be, oh, we got to go and charge down the hill. Uh, Ellis Spear will talk about the fact that people said, oh, we're going to swing like a door. You see that in the movie. We're going to sweep down the hill. Spear says, I saw these guys start to go, so my guys started going down the hill. So there's all kinds of different stories. Remember, you're in the crescendo of battle, and a lot of these guys are writing many, many years after the war about what may or may not have happened up here. What we do know for certain is that the 20th Maine will charge down this hill and help to clear out this low land. Now, they aren't the only men to fight up here. Remember, we have other units, as Chris pointed out. We have Patty O'Rourke, who's killed in action. Uh, we have Stephen Weed, Charles Hazlitt. We have many others who are up on this hill fighting just as hard. And not only are they charging down this side of the hill, the New Yorkers of the 140th are charging down the other side of the hill. So let's make our way down to the monument. Chris, looks like you have, just, all right. I'm gonna take the camera so that we can have Doug step in here. Okay. So Doug, well, one of the things you said that you were interested in was the, the movie Gettysburg, and it really got you into to this, um, into this battle and into the Civil War. You know, let's talk a little bit about the movie. You know, I didn't see Buster Kilrain's name on the monument, <laughs> and I didn't find him in the National Cemetery. So, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the movie and cinema magic? Well, so remember, the movie is based on the on Michael Shara's novel, his Pulitzer Prize-winning novel of the Civil War, which is about the Battle of Gettysburg, is really about seven people. Um, and one of those is Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Chamberlain is fortunate in the fact that uh, he is he lives uh, to be 85 years old and does not die until 1914. He also becomes governor of Maine for four terms, a very popular governor, and president of Bowdoin College, which means he is around a long time to outlast and outright many of his contemporaries that fought on the hill, especially guys like Strong Vincent, uh, Stephen Weed, Patty O'Rourke, Hazlitt, guys like that we talked about who have already been killed before this day is over. So Chamberlain stands out and is gravitated to toward, gravitated towards by Michael Shara, who's going to make him one of the key figures in his novel, and he therefore becomes one of the key figures in the movie Gettysburg from 1993, played by Jeff Daniels. Uh, and it was that movie that really helped crystallize my love for the Civil War, and in particular, this part of the Gettysburg battlefield. And so when I come here, um, I think about, the, you know, there are pictures of me here at 13 years old standing right over there uh, with the stone walls in the background with a, with a Civil War hat on my head like I'm wearing right now. Um, and I think, you know, over time, as people have studied the battle and get more into it, they start to realize that it wasn't just Joshua Chamberlain who saved the Union left flank or saved the Union army at Gettysburg or saved the, the United States from becoming two countries in 1863, but that story is something that people gravitate towards. Chamberlain as an individual is an interesting figure, is a person of, you know, in more or less of upstanding character and somebody worth studying and getting into and through studying him and studying the battle I've gotten more interested in the Civil War and yes I've started I've started to take him down off the pedestal that I had him on when I was 13 years old but as Gary Edelman once said in a podcast it is more important that people get interested in the story in the first place and then they get the real history and sort of peel back some of the layers that you get from the drama and what can be more dramatic than to stand up here on Vincent Spur and look out over this this field and imagine what it would have been like in real life to charge down this hill. How many sprained ankles came out of the bayonet charge of the 20th Maine? Um, and to think about the, we can peel back the layers of the drama of the, of the filmmaking and think about the fact that real people with real lives, with their real blood, sweat, and tears fought on this hill to preserve the nation that we know. 
regardless of who is the one and single savior of the Union Army at Gettysburg, and I don't think there is one, regardless of that, we now are, have a connection to the story that we can see in the film and that, we can, that, that draws us here to this place and so that the vision can pass into our souls, as Chamberlain once said. I don't think I can top that one. So uh, we're going to bring you more coverage here from Gettysburg. I'm Chris White. Thanks to Chris Mikowski, Doug Ullman. Please share this with your friends and your family and go over to battlefields.org and hopefully you'll click that donate button or maybe become a member of the American Battlefield Trust. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.